everybody and welcome back to Lesbian News Flash. Lesbian News Flash is uh, us lesbians that get the alert using our little corner of the internet to promote lesbian visibility and give airtime to lesbian, lesbian-led projects, and especially when they have a lesbian or feminist activist focus, because I don't know about you, but I think one week a year of lesbian visibility is a joke. We need much more than that to give justice to our brilliant sisters and their really cool projects. So that's why we're here. As always, if you have some news to share, if you are creating exciting lesbian or women only project, if you are organizing stuff you want us to promote, if you have plans to overthrow the patriarchy, we want to hear from you. So please be in touch. And uh, also to let you know that those chats are available on our YouTube channel. So please go and have a look um, later when you can. So, um, Voila. So today I'm really excited for our les second lesbian news flash to uh, welcome Thistle Patterson. Hello, Thistle. I'm going Hi, to Angela. Shortly, uh, Thistle Patterson is a singer, a songwriter, a cyclist, a lover of nature. A lesbian, ooh, I can't see my screen now. <laughs> a lesbian feminist radio broadcaster at WLRN. If you haven't checked out Women's Liberation Radio News, I suggest you do because it's really quality stuff and a channel that's run for five years. She lives in Midwestern part of the US and she frequents the, wait for it, Chicago Feminist Salon. Okay, a group that meets monthly to spin and weave feminist ideas, theory and practice that makes me want to move to Chicago. Thistle is releasing a new studio album uh, of original songs and two cover tunes. It's called Dross Into Gold. And this album comes after years of being blacklisted at local venues in her town, in her own town, yes, due to trans activist complaints and cry of transphobia, blah, blah, blah. We know it's always the same tune. So welcome, Thistle. How are you? Thank you. I'm great. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Thanks to come and say hi. It's really lovely to have you. Um, I wanted to ask you a few questions, as you can imagine. And, you know, you've been consistently cancelled. It's happening in your own town, as I said. I'm really impressed by your resilience in front of these attacks and what happened to you. And I wondered if you could tell us about what about yourself, about your music career, uh, your experience with the trans activist but also about how you know you kept going how you carried on and how you're still here with so much attacks yeah thank you so much well i started playing music pretty much right away um i sang off the the uh back of my dad's bicycle he would he would ride his bike um to the kindergarten where i went when i was two or the preschool um and he said that i was making up songs and chirping like a little bird off the back of the bike and they were original songs and so that's that's when my music career started mm -hmm. and then later on in high school i really loved the beatles and i loved the melodies and the harmonies and the arrangements and what they were doing and i also just started exploring the com complexities of music but what i found out is that almost all of the musicians that i admired and aspired to be like were men and that most of the time women uh were singing backup vocals or they were the lead singer scantily clad you know objectified as kind of an ornament at the center of the stage and not really being treated like the artists that we are i I was exposed to Joni Mitchell, Ani DeFranco, um, and they influenced me a lot to believe in myself as a real musician and, and artist and not just somebody who's gonna sing at a campfire or sing background vocals, somebody who can play an instrument, the guitar. Um, so I learned how to play the guitar from a woman uh, uh, teacher and that, that helped me a lot with my confidence to have a female teacher. And that was when I was 15. It took me a while to pick up my instrument. I think because I was female, you know, you often hear male musicians talking about how they picked up their guitar when they were like eight or nine years old. It took me a long time. I was singing way before I was playing my instrument, um, which I think is kind of typical for female singer songwriters. Um, and then getting into my career as a, a, an adult, I joined, I started a band. I um, did that by uh, procuring an open mic hosting gig in downtown Madison. Mm -hmm. And so once a week on, I think it was weekly. Yeah, it was like once a week back in 2007, 2008, 
I um, hosted an open mic. And so all these musicians would come in weekly and I would always play a few songs before the open mic would start. And um, so I met all these musicians and I had several people that would come and play with me. I'm, I'm really social with music. I feel like, especially when it's live, it's a chance. I'm not a sing-along musician, but <laughs> with other musicians, I really like it when they improv with the stuff that I'm doing and my stuff lends itself to that. It's very creative and patchwork and, and original. So um, I had all these musicians that I was playing with and I would form various incarnations. I went on tour in 2011 with an inca incarnation of Thistle and Thorns and played bars and venues and felt and even made like $3,000 at a university gig. So I felt like my career was, you know, taking off and I, and I procured this regular show at the Crystal Corner Bar, which is a, a major music venue in Madison in my neighborhood. And the way I got that was by hanging out at the bar. There were other artists, other musicians, other theater people. And there was a theater woman there who actually took me under her wing mm -hmm. um, and she knew I was being persecuted by trans activists because back in 2014, I interviewed Sheila Jeffries on yeah. WRT 89.9 FM that's, community. That's a while ago, huh? That's, that's 2014 is when it started. Yep, that is a while ago. And at that time, I had no idea that they would attack my music career. I thought maybe they would, you know, I don't know. Like, I just thought we were going to have a civil discussion and a dialogue. I was that naive. I thought community radio is for the community to get in, involved with conversations and getting to know each other and we'll create a safe space and I'll have Sheila Jeffries on and it won't be a problem <laughs> is kind of what I was thinking. And, and they ended up being extremely vicious and, um, Fast forwarding to the year 2017, this man that I knew as Christopher uh, transitioned to um, Christine and he um, started a band. Uh, I think his band started in 27, end of 2017, end of 2018. And it gave him, he's an autogonophile, and it gave him a lot of confidence to just knock my band out of the music scene. Um, so the name of the band is Dumpster Dick. Right. And you're going to put up okay. one of their logos um, yes. on the screen here, and we'll talk it's about... A, it's quite a recurrent thing uh, that they use the, the, um, to like the, try to destroy a woman's career to actually bring their own career to life. So that's, that's them, yes? Yes, this is their logo. And as you can see, there's a gas can at the bottom of the dumpster and there are flames. And it says Turf Destroya 666 because they also, I guess, are Satanists or whatever, you know. Um, but this band was getting gigs and shows at places that I used to get gigs and shows in my neighborhood. Mm. And it, it felt like they were just pissing all over the neighborhood on the sidewalks of these venues that I used to be able to play at. And really they're saying that I'm excluding them. Mm. And then look, I don't get to play my shows anymore. They're excluding me and they're threatening all women with burning us in a dumpster if we don't believe that in female penis. You know what I mean? And so anyway, I couldn't believe Angela. I could not believe, I still can't believe, for the record, I can't believe that Madison officials went along with this. This band was advertised in the Madison Isthmus Weekly newspaper. Um, this band was able to convince, Christine Elaine was able to organize hundreds of people to complain to venues about me and my band. Here's an example of an event that Christine and, uh, uh, created. No plan platform for transphobia. Well, I had a show, a regular show at the Crystal Corner Bar, and it was really fun. These people never even went to the show. I never even talked about trans. Why? I'm a full human being. I, I write songs about nature and bike riding and all kinds of things, you know, and so, and that's what I was singing about at the bar. We would have pizza. It was all these artists, Madison neighborhood local artists, 
theater people. We'd get together and I'd play music with different people who wanted to play with me and we would have a really great time. That's what he was protesting. Um, and that's him sort of a close up. Although let's look at the, the words here. Stand okay. with um, the Madison DeGenderettes and Madison's queer and trans community to protest the Crystal Corner Bar's decision to continue to offer a platform to folk musician and trans exclusionary radical feminist. Oh my gosh, that just makes me so mad. Now the Madison DeGenderettes their Facebook page, which has posted pictures of me and just horrible crap about me for a couple years, is inactive now. I have not heard about these people in a long time. I don't really know what happened to Christine. They're Lane. probably married with children, but the degenerate, as I remember, somewhere in San Francisco, were the one hanging around in dike marches with baseball bats, right? Exactly. So they, were, they were the one taking the 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 libraries. I remember that they had a big exhibition in San Francisco library as well. So that's that's a, an offshoot of them, I suppose. Yes, and so how could? Official people in Madison, the um, board of directors at the Wilmar Neighborhood Center, for example, why would they listen to this individual and not me? I just don't get it. It just seems it's so blatantly sexist and misogynist to have baseball bats, pink and blue baseball bats in a demonstration threatening violence against women. It's like yeah. beyond the pale. And yet somehow the woke folks in Madison went along with all of this and destroyed my music career. Yeah, what strikes me is that this happened to you a while ago. So you said it started in 2014. That was that particular uh, instance was in 17 or 18, you said, and it's still going. It's still happening now in the UK. We, we, we still have been today. There was this big story about Jester Waltz, who is uh, an embroidery artist who's been deplatformed by the Royal Academy cancelled by the Royal Academy. And now there's some big backlash. And there's so big backlash also because a lot of these women are established, are part of the establishment. So they have, you know, a voice to actually say, hey. But it's, I have to say, back in 2014, back in 2017, you know, we were not in a position to do that. So I think it's really important to, you know, backtrack and say this has happened for years and years and years to generations of women artists. Yeah, and so now let's get to the resilience part. Yeah. Take this yucky right. slide move. off of the screen. And, See you later. <laughs> and I want to talk about <laughs> my current music career and how COVID-19, the um, social aspect of it, has actually been really good for my music career. Um, I am a preschool teacher, and I they had to... Well, a lot of children were disenrolled from the center uh, about a year and a few months ago because we were on lockdown. And so parents had to keep their kids at home. And so then I went on unemployment mm. and it turns out I started making more money on unemployment than I was as a preschool teacher. Plus I had more time. Same thing was happening with my friend. And so my friend who is an amazing musician that I've known my entire life, mm. um, loves the Beatles, loves melodies, harmonies, loves arranging songs, treating a song like it's a work of art. And so because my friend had time and I had time and we have made studio albums in the past, we got together and we made 12 songs that are like um, captured sound paintings with lots of different instrumentation. You can hear it actually on the, um, you can hear what the, so the album is gonna sound like on my um, fundraiser page because there was a video that was created for the song Dross Into Gold. Yes, and it's really beautiful and I'm going to share it as soon as I worked it out in the, in the chat right now. So that's the name of the album, it's Dross Into Gold. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit how you came up with the name? Yes. Um, and I feel like this is really in alignment with how I've done music my whole life, which is I'm very collaborative. I'm really open. Yes, I'm the main songwriter. I play the guitar, which is, you know, the rhythm guitar. Um, but yet I leave lots of room for others to jump on board and collaborate with me and find their vibe in the song. Mm. And so um, Elizabeth Miller asked me to write a oh, song yes, yes. to promote 
this, this lovely, yes. <laughs> this lovely publication, um, spinning and weaving, and uh, she is the contributing editor, and she wanted to celebrate the the book release, which was very recently. You have an article in there. I have an article as well, and I love it. It's just such a grassroots collection of women's living theory and thoughts that we're spinning and weaving together, and. So um, she asked me to write a song to celebrate the release of the book. And I was like, cool, well, what do you want the lyrics? How do you want, the, you as the editor, why don't you send me some ideas for what you want the lyrics to be like? And mm -hmm. so she sent me this brainstorm Excellent. with a lot of the words that you find in, in the lyrics. So I gave her credit for being a co-writer of the lyrics. And yeah. one of the things she said in the brainstorm was, we are sisters spinning and weaving dross in, wait, we are sisters spinning and weaving patriarchal dross into gold. And so I dropped all of, all of it and just got to the crux of, of that message, which is the patriarchy is shit, right? And let's compost it and spin and weave it into something that's so valuable and um, has this luster that, um, you know, that we can celebrate and that we can feel good about as members of society and that it will actually transform the whole society. Like let's spin and weave that dross into gold, that patriarchal crap, mm. rubbish. I love that line. Yeah. You know? The song is really lovely. So I've just posted the link. If you can have a look there, the, the video is on that, uh, on that crowdfunder and it's, uh, it's really beautiful. Really beautiful. So um, what was your inspiration for the album? You said that. And what's your favorite song? Would it be that one then? Well, I mean, in a way, it's that one just because it's it's opened up so many doors for mm -hmm. me. And it also has a spirit of sisterhood and um, comradeship that runs really deep. Okay. And I think that by spinning and weaving sisterhood and solidarity amongst ourselves, women as women, we begin to transform society. We begin to take the focus off. The default focus in our male society is the male is the citizen. The male is the one who makes decisions. And so that song, Dross Into Gold, is a call for females to come together and create our own um, separate space that's funky, that's witchy, that's artistic, you know, and full of love for women and appreciation for our ancestry even and for the for our, our mothers and grandmothers that have come before. It's it's all in the sun. Mother spider, like thinking of the spider and and how she spins and weaves and but but having said that, I don't know if I have a favorite song because <laughs> it's a whole album. I can't stress that enough. It's like working with the same friend that I've worked with before in the past and uh, us being of the age that we are. I grew up in the 1970s. Yeah. I was very small. Mm -hmm. And then in the 80s, I was a teenager. Okay. And, um, and my friend grew up in that same era. And so we used to listen to albums, whole albums on headphones, kicked back like in a, on a couch or staring out the window. And it was an entire experience for like 45 minutes. And the first song would tell a little story that would lead to the second song that tells a story that leads to the next. And, and that's, and so I don't really have a favorite song in the sense of, it's a complete album. These 12 songs, the ones that I've chosen to put on the album and the order in which they flow yeah. are meant to be a whole experience. So I advise uh, music lovers, especially to listen to it in, in your headphones. Yeah, it's true experience. that in this area of uh, you can download any song and it doesn't have a context. It's really good to go back to. I, I love your your story of the 70s. That's I, I grew up a little bit after you, but I still have this you know, this an album will tell you a story, it will take you somewhere, you want to listen to all of it, not just one. And yes, I really relate to that. And I really relate to what you say about building, you know, building uh, sisterhood, building the culture, our love of women, our separatist space. And for me, the link between art and activism are here. Like, you know, it's really about building something that wasn't there before. So really, really appreciate to hear that. And also that's one of the reasons we do this because 
there's plenty of ways to bring about change and I think art is the most exciting, fresh, um, radical, revolutionary way to do that. So yes. <laughs> cool. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, back in the, the early 2000s, there was a group called Art and Revolution mm. that grew out of the anti-capitalist movement in the Battle of Seattle in 2000. And I had a friend who participated in Art and Revolution and it was all about that. They would rent out like huge warehouse spaces and make these giant paper mache puppets. And you would walk into this warehouse and you couldn't believe what you saw, like all of this art and all of these people cooperating and collaborating and making art together for demonstrations in the streets that were very impactful. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, I think that art for social change, cultural change, I mean, art is culture. Art, yeah, of course. And then if you do women's art or lesbian art, you focus on us, as you say, we just regroup and ground ourselves in our own reality, which is, you know, of course, what we're not allowed to do. Um, how, tell us a bit how uh, uh, viewers can support this album project. Can we pre-order a copy of the album? How, um, yes, what do we do? Yes, please go to my fundraiser that's posted uh, on the Facebook page. That's where you posted it? Yes, okay. I just posted it on the event page. It's on the Facebook page as okay. well. Okay, yeah. yeah, please please go to that fundraiser and you only need to uh, give me $15 to pre-order this really well-made album. I can't emphasize enough that working with this particular friend that I'm working with, it's just gonna be mwah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but obviously if you want to donate more, it's going to go, it's all going to pre-production and production costs. Um, something that musicians, you know, have to think about. And um, I give this album as a gift, but it's worth something, right? And so please click on the, the, the fundraiser to support uh, lesbian feminist mu music. Mm -hmm. um, although having said that, I would say that that's who I am, but I created this album purposely with these 12 songs. I don't know if you know Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz. She was a Mexican nun. No. In, okay, well, at the um, turn of the 17th, no, 16th century, she was a nun in um, Mexico. And her, at that time, you as a woman, you either got married or you were, you went to the church. Okay. Anyway, she she was a physicist, she was a musician, she was a poet, brilliant lady, and not allowed, not allowed to study, not allowed to. And so she would write poetry, and it was in code. And later, we would we as analysts of her poetry would be able to decipher what she was talking about. And some of my songs in this 12 song set are definitely like that. But I, I created the album so that everyone can enjoy it because okay. my music career is separate from my political activism in some ways, at least in the ways that that um, it should be, I mean, anybody can un understand or, or can get something from this album. You know, like it's meant to be enjoyed as a work of art, as music. And yes, there's some politics in there, but I totally kept all of the trans crap yes, out. Yes, No, no, if you wanted women, <laughs> women centered, you know. Right. <laughs> Obviously. Well, that's brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. So will you please, will you please, please play something for us? <laughs> okay. I do my guitar here. I was prepared yes. for this. <laughs> this is a song on the album called My Name. And I dedicate it to my parents. Um, and it's because one of the things that happened is when they were attacking me, they attacked my Facebook page because I was using my nickname, which I've had this nickname since the summer of 2003 when I started riding my bike south on a bike music tour that ended up being three years long. And um, I changed my name to Thistle because of that tour and my experiences in nature. And I just wanted to keep it. And so I did, and everybody was calling me that. I had thousands of Facebook friends. And then they attacked my Facebook page. Facebook required me to show my driver's license. I lived with my... Um, 
given name uh, on my Facebook page for a few months, but then I went to the courthouse, got the papers and laid them down and I had to ride my bicycle through the rain to the Social Security Administration building in the same neighborhood where I grew up as a child. And this song just comes from that. And there's obviously the, um, anyway, here we go. I really enjoyed this and I really enjoyed it when you played um, the one you played at spinning and weaving as well it was really really moving to uh, I just love live music it's not really live music but it's as live as we can get it you know <laughs> yeah and and hint hint um, there is a band a, a women's a female feminist band in the works that I won't say anymore like the band name or anything but it I think it's gonna work I've met uh, another musician who is really good. She's a feminist and she's got the time. Oh. I've got the time. And so, Project. yeah. Yes, that's brilliant. Well, so as we said, you can support Thistle's uh, buy album by buying her album, by donating to her page, by doing both of those things. Yes, um, the, li the link is on the page. You've got six days left to do that. So don't miss the chance. And uh, you are getting a really cool album. You're also a really well-crafted album. And you are also supporting a lesbian artist and you are also archiving lesbian history. So don't miss. All good reasons, yeah. yeah. Is there anything left you want to say? Final words before we, um, we all uh, say goodbye. Oh, just that it's great to be a part of this global movement with you, Angela. I've been watching you online and it's, thank you for having me on the show and let's just keep the dialogue going. Let's keep on lifting each other up and big up the female, as we say Definitely. over here. I hear we are going to speak very soon, maybe. So <laughs> we'll, we'll speak to you later. Um, okay. So please share everybody, share this video, share the fundraiser, spread the word around about Lesbian News Flash into your lesbian networks. And uh, thanks for watching. 
thank you everybody see you all next time for more lesbian news and thank you this all again and um take good care <laughs> okay bye bye bye